Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just hit that notification button to be notified about our next show. You are live with the app show. Mike Agarbo here. We've got fellow app nerds, John Beeler, Graham Williams. We've got a pretty cool show today. Lots to talk about in the uh, mobile world. Uh, later on, we'll be talking with our good friend, Crit, uh, Ted Kritsonos uh, out of Toronto about the new LG 60, 60V, or is it just the LG 60? V60. V60. <laughs> they make it super easy. Uh, this one's going to be interesting. You'll want to stay tuned for his review, and we'll actually have a, a full review up on our website as well. This is uh, one of LG's uh, dual screen phones. Not one of the foldable ones uh, where the screen folds in half, but it's got two screens and it kind of folds into a clamshell. Uh, so he's uh, got uh, some interesting uh, thoughts and takes uh, on that. We'll also be chatting with the folks at RVZ. If you have been thinking about getting away this summer, you probably realized you're not going to be flying anywhere anytime soon for the most part. A lot of people are looking at camping. Well, RVZ is like the Airbnb for campers and trailers uh, if you want to uh, rent one. And uh, it connects you up with uh, people in your community that are doing that. It's actually pretty cool. We'll be talking with uh, Michael McNaught, uh, one of the founders uh, there. Let's talk about some of the uh, app news, uh, guys. A lot going on. Uh, a big one this week is uh, Bell and TELUS have uh, chosen Ericsson, uh, and I think uh, TELUS uh, was Ericsson and Nokia, for their new 5G uh, network infrastructure that they're uh, building. They had uh, tapped Huawei to supply a chunk of it, but uh, now it looks like they're going a different direction. Surprised? Yes, actually. Yeah. I, uh, you know, when we originally started talking about this, I thought that this was going to take uh, government involvement. Um, you know, it's, uh, there, I think a lot of Canadians were saying that they would prefer not to have this particular vendor uh, involved. Uh, obviously, there are tons of political issues surrounding it. So TELUS had already made some rather large investments into 5G with Huawei. And so to see them step back from that, uh, it, it, it sounds like they're listening to their consumers. I have a different take. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it comes down to dollars and cents. If TELUS and Bell are doing any contracts uh, with the US or any other countries that have issues with Huawei, that uh, would prevent them from uh, doing business there. And uh, it comes down to the, uh, to the money. And Fair maybe, enough. maybe they're listening a bit. <laughs> Tumors. It's interesting though, like, like you said, Graham, <clears throat> that everyone was sort of waiting for the government's stand on this whole situation. And then basically these companies have made a decision for themselves and um, kind of negated the need for us to wait for that decision anymore. Unless the government says you have to use Huawei, which doesn't seem possible. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's kind of interesting to see that uh, they've done that, but you know, there's still other providers in Canada and we'll see what they have to say, but businesses and corporations uh, and stockholders do not like uncertainty. And this was, this has been dragged on for a long time. Don't you agree? Like the government hasn't really made uh, any decisions one way or another. So, uh, you know, if I was a TELUS or a Bell, I, at one point I'd have to look and go, you know, if this drags on for another six months or even 12 months, uh, you know, especially during the pandemic here now, um, you know, they can't wait that long. So, you know, they have made investments with Huawei uh, gear and they might have to write some of that off. But uh, now they have certainty, which is uh, a key thing for, you know, these, these public companies. Graham, you're going to say something? Graham died. Graham has frozen. Let's uh, look at uh, one of the other stories we're following. And uh, John, this is interesting. There's a new Facebook feature that lets you easily mass delete old posts. Yeah, this is a really handy feature that's currently rolling out <clears throat> to the mobile version of Facebook for now on iOS and Android. Um, and it's, it's not out for everybody yet, but it is coming. Uh, and it will be available on the web version of Facebook uh, in the near future. But it's really meant for allowing you to go back in time and either archive old posts. So say, for example, you're starting a new job and you want to get rid of all those drunk party photos. Um, <laughs> Or you maybe had a bad relationship and you want to purge all of that content from your Facebook profile. This allows you to go back in time, uh, either identify things to be archived so they're only viewable by you and nothing else is public anymore, 
or you can completely trash them. Uh, it has like a trash uh, recycling bin uh, option as well, where you can archive them and then they'll go into the trash bin and after 30 days, they'll be actually deleted permanently. Interesting. And, and you've looked into this. Does it look simple? Like sometimes they say they can do these things and you got to dig through menus and menus. Well, yeah, it's typical Facebook. You have to menu dive a little bit, um, but it does look pretty straightforward. And, it, and it's interesting that they're actually launching it on your smartphone first. So uh, the user interface is a little bit uh, less convoluted than going through the website itself. Looking at some of the other stories we're following here on the app show, uh, I think I can predict the uh, the third uh, wave uh, of uh, the COVID uh, virus, John. <laughs> yes, I think you can. One of the big shows that we're always excited about every year would happen to be the Consumer Electronics Show. CES happens every January. They have announced that they are going forward with the face-to-face -face, uh, exhibition. So they will be holding it down in Las uh, Vegas. Uh, I think, you know, obviously there'll be more details on how they will... Uh, you know, adhere to social distancing, but I just don't know how that's possible when you have literally, you know, between a hundred to 150,000 people converging on that, uh, on that city and that show alone. Well, this past year though, it was 170,000. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't think everyone's going to make it this year, but I mean, there's still uh, a chunk load of people that, uh, that will. So I just, I mean, I'm just interested to see, you know, where we are going to be as we get closer to that date. Yeah, we were talking uh, off air about the fact that, you know, let's assume things have sorted themselves out. Um, that doesn't seem that likely that by January we'll have everything sorted out. So if we wanted to go to CES, are we going to have to isolate when we come back? That type of thing. Like there's a lot of unknown questions and which will, you know, we're going to have to decide in the fall if we're going to go or not. Yeah. Because you need to start making those plans and booking things and that kind of thing. And who knows if we're going to be able to even book a flight to the U S by then. And if, yeah, I mean, if, if I have to be quarantined when I get back for 14 days from a business perspective, you know, can I afford that? Will that make sense? Well, I mean, I guess I am used to working from home <laughs> all the yeah. time, now, but uh, for a lot of people, that's uh, definitely a decision that uh, they are going to have to uh, make. We do have uh, lots to talk about on today's uh, program. As I had mentioned earlier, we will be uh, talking with uh, our friend Ted Kritsonos about the new LG phone that has two screens. You can have one screen or you can uh, use the case and put a second screen in there, kind of like a clamshell, and have uh, two different things going on at the same time. Will you care? Is it cool? Well, Ted gives us uh, his honest opinion uh, as uh, always. Plus, I've, uh, I've got a great guest on coming up next here. His name is Michael Binknot. Uh, and he will be telling us about his uh, app and business it's called RVZ, spelled R-V-E-Z-Y. It's a, uh, a service that lets you connect with other people that want to rent out their trailers and RVs. And I wish they had this years ago because uh, I've had my tent trailer uh, literally sitting in my driveway for like 50 weeks of the year. So it would have been nice to, to rent that out and make some money, but now's my uh, chance. Don't forget to hit our website, www.getconnectedmedia.com. We're giving away lots of prizes uh, throughout the year. And all you have to do to enter the contest is go to, again, the newsletter, subscribe, and you are entered to win. When we come back, RVZ, the easy way to rent a trailer. Back after this. You are back with the App Show. Mike and John here in our home studios. Well, I think a lot of people's vacation plans have uh, changed dramatically uh, this year due to the uh, pandemic. Uh, I think many more people will be going camping. Well, there's uh, some exciting news. Uh, there's uh, like an Airbnb for campers and trailers. We're going to be talking uh, with uh, Michael McNaught over at RVZ. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Did I pronounce that right? Is it R RVZ or is it RVEZ? You know what? We, uh, we answer to both, but the RVZ, RVEZ, it all works for us. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is an app uh, that you can uh, download for uh, your smartphones. Uh, I believe uh, you can also access uh, it through uh, the website. Uh, tell our listeners uh, what it's all about and what they can uh, check out out there. 
So the really easy way to understand it is really the Airbnb concept, but for travel trailers and motorhomes. What we allow people to do is if you own a motorhome or travel trailer, you're able to list it on the site and rent it out to people that are looking to travel. And travelers renting directly from us, you're, you're renting from somebody local in the community. And the prices, you're, you're saving typically about 40% from traditional rental options, you know, going to a larger fleet company that owns all the vehicles. Uh, because you are renting directly from an owner. And so what kind of prices are we typically looking uh, at just to give people like a ballpark range? Oh, great, great question. So what's nice about our platform is that because it's all owner driven, the variety is endless. So you can have anything from a, a small tent trailer uh, for two people or go up to the, the rock star experience in, in a, an RV that has, you know, granite countertops and everything. From a travel trailer perspective, you're looking at anywhere from the $80 to $120 a night. And for a motorhome, typically the $150 to $200 a night would get you into something really, really nice. And so what's involved? Uh, obviously, you set up an account, um, put credit card information in. Uh, once you've selected a trailer, I imagine you put in the dates that uh, you want. And um, then I guess you got to go to this person's house to get it. How does that work? Yeah, so what happens through the website or the app is you're going to put in what's called a request to book, is you're essentially inquiring with the owner of whether they're willing to rent it to you. So, you know, it's, you provide an introductory message, you're going to let them know what are your travel plans, how many people are traveling, and then the owner at that point, they'll communicate back and forth, but they will approve the request. At that point, you, you make a payment, you pay for your rental, and then you just make uh, arrangements with the owner uh, to pick it up directly at their house or wherever they keep it. Or an option that we actually see a lot of travelers choosing is a delivery option. So they actually request the owner to deliver it to their location. So there's not much of a better experience than renting a campsite and having the owner drop it off, set it up, and make sure it's all good to go. You just pull up, enjoy it for your vacation, and leave, and they'll pick it up when you're done. I like the delivery option. <laughs> that sounds, <laughs> yeah. uh, sounds appealing. So you're actually getting hooked up uh, with people that are close to you, like, uh, you know, within a certain mile radius. Does it automatically select that? And so that's what's great is that you'll search the location that you're looking to pick up from or have it delivered to. Uh, what, what makes us kind of unique is that our inventory is located all across Canada from small towns to big cities. So if you're looking to, to travel somewhere more remote, you can do that directly. As far as the uh, the owners are concerned, I, this is kind of appealing. I have a tent trailer myself that I I would say literally sits there fifty weeks of uh, of the the year. Um, but you know, I would be concerned renting it out to other people. Like, is there any insurance or anything involved in case they, you know, blow it up or set it on fire? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and number one, we actually see a very, very, very low claim percentage. Um, and I think that's just a direct result of renting from somebody locally. You know, there's just a, a heightened sense of responsibility when you're renting somebody directly from the owner. Uh, but we carry... Uh, insurance coverage on everything that's rented through the website. So when it's rented, the liability falls onto our commercial policy and you're fully covered up to the actual, the, the replacement value of that travel trailer. And you're also covered at, uh, for any motorhomes that, that are being rented. So it just gives that, that assurance to the owner that they are covered because unfortunately your personal insurance coverage will not provide coverage during the rental period. So if I were to rent my tent trailer out for hundred bucks a night, uh, how much am I getting? So you'd be getting $85 in your pocket. So there, we, we hold on to a 15% service fee, which helps us offset some of the costs of insurance and, and running the platform and all the marketing involved and the payment processing. So it's, it's a very attractive offer for owners that, you know, every $100, you're keeping 85% of that. And, and just so I'm clear again, uh, you know, if I've stocked up my, my trailer or motorhome, uh, you know, with towels and stuff like that, if stuff goes missing, can I claim that against insurance or how does that work? Yeah, so there, there's insurance and, you know, think about your typical car insurance, anything that you can make a claim on your car insurance or house insurance type thing, you can do that through ours as well. Uh, what you're talking about, those would be kind of more incidental damages. Uh, you know, you spill a pot of coffee on the, on, the, on the rugs or something and it needs cleaning. That would be collected out of a security deposit that's provided by the renter. And, you know, we always encourage people to talk back and forth. We're all adults. Most people are able to come up with, uh, you know, a, 
but some compensation or whatever if there are any damages. But again, our experience is, is that there really isn't that many damages that happen. And when they do happen, people realize their mistakes and are more than, more than open to, to, to pay for it. I guess it's kind of like Airbnb where uh, the, the host or the rent, the renter of the, 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 the vehicle or in this case, they would choose what they want to provision that vehicle with, right? Whether it's, you know, need your own towels or here's towels that we're going to include and we'll launder afterwards, that type of thing. And it, it sort of might vary per owner, I guess. Yeah, it all varies per owner, but uh, we'd see the majority of owners, they, they include most of the stuff that's in your RV. And Mike, I'm sure you can attest that taking all your personal items out of that travel trailer uh, would probably be a bit of a pain. So it's, it, it's kind of nice for the renters when they come and, you know, the barbecues there, the outdoor mat, uh, all, all the, the furnishings are in there. Um, and, you know, given this COVID-19 pandemic, we do see a lot of co- communication with the renter and owner just, you know, would you like us to provide linens or would you like to bring your own? You know, what, what type of precautions are you taking cleaning this uh, to make sure that I feel safe picking it up? And uh, all of our owners seem to have great communication with the people renting and they're able to have those, those talks on their own to make sure everyone's comfortable. How is the inventory right now? Uh, I guess uh, with no one really <laughs> taking any flights anywhere, I think a lot of people are camping. And we've seen an incredible increase in our reservations. Uh, you know, we're, we're about 30, 40% ahead of where we were in the peak season of last year. So it's, it's a pretty incredible jump. Uh, but what's interesting is we're also seeing a similar increase on owners that are looking to rent out their units. And it, it kind of makes sense given the environment that, you know, unfortunately millions of Canadians are, you know, have been hit financially or lost their jobs during this pandemic. And if you have an RV sitting around the driveway, it, it's a great source of additional income this summer. And, and it's also true on the renter side is renting through RVZ, you're renting directly from one of your neighbors. You're, you're putting money back into your local economy and helping support those Canadian families that may be struggling financially. I, I got to tell you, I love this idea. You know, I've been thinking about uh, upgrading my my trailer. You know, I've got a tent trailer right now, and I'm thinking about getting you know like something a little bit bigger, uh, a little more fancy. But I thought, you know, I just don't use it often enough. But something like this would be appealing because I could get you know a nicer trailer and then actually make some some money on on the side uh, with it when I'm not using it. Like I said, because I'm only using it for a few weeks out of the year. And, and, and we actually see that of a lot of our owners is they're, they're thinking about upgrading, thinking about trading in, but then they, they start renting out that particular unit and that will provide the revenue and the income to actually go out and purchase an additional RV. So we, we see many of our owners season after season adding to their own personal fleet of RVs. <laughs> you know, rather than trading it in and getting little value on it, you can use it as your rental trailer that will finance the, the new one that you want to buy. I could be the trailer king. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could be the trailer king. Just don't be the tiger king. No, that's a good point. We're talking with Michael McNaught. He is uh, one of the founders of RVZ. That's spelled R-V-E-Z-Y. Uh, this is a great kind of Airbnb for trailers and RVs and tent trailers uh, that you can uh, rent, uh, rent out or rent if you are in need of one. Thanks for joining us today, Michael. Excellent. Thank you for having me. When we come back from the break, more apps to talk about here on the App Show. Stay tuned. You are back with the App Show. Mike Eggerbo here with John Beeler. We're going to uh, head all the way to Toronto virtually with our good friend Ted Kritsonos. Uh, he's had a chance to review one of the latest LG smartphones. And are two screens better than one? We've talked about foldable phones uh, from Samsung and HTC and Motorola. Well, LG has taken a different take on this. Thanks for joining us, Ted. Happy to be with you guys. So uh, this phone has two screens, but it's not a folding LCD screen, so to speak. Explain to our listeners how this all works. Yeah, so, so it's the LG V60 Think. Uh, it, it, you're, not, you're not committing to the two screens. So you can actually buy this phone just as a regular phone. You don't have to get the second screen. But there is an attachment that you can put the phone into that has a second screen that is attached to it. And what happens is when, when they're connected, the, you can activate the second screen to work either together with the main screen or independently of the main screen. So in other words, you can have one app on one and then one app open on the other. So for multitasking or get, you know, doing two things at the same time, it, it is very, very useful in that regard. Who is this aimed at, Ted? 
It's a good question. <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I, you know, for, because first of all, if you're going to use a device like this, like unlike the Galaxy Fold or you know what Samsung's worked on, anytime we've seen like a dual screen uh, device, normally the if, what they're trying to do is to make it we, you know easy to wield, you know, pocketable, something that it doesn't feel like it's too thick. This is not that. This is not the case here. This is a big phone. I mean, first of all, it's like you know, it's a six point four inch uh, display, uh, so it's a large screen. Now multiply that by two, right, and then add extra thickness because the case that comes with the screen is also pretty thick. So what you have is a phone that together weighs three hundred and fifty grams, way more. Like that's more than double, you know, the average smartphone, and also you're getting double the thickness too, for the most part. So it, it, you have to be okay with that kind of size to begin with before you even, you know, contemplate going with this thing. But if you're a multitasker, if you're some, somebody who really wants, the, uh, you know, to be able to watch a video, let's say, on one screen and then do something productive on the other. So you're messaging somebody on one screen and then you got a video going the other, or you have two messaging apps at the same time. You've got Slack and Trello open at the same time. That might be appealing, you know. I, I, it, to me, I think those are the main factors. You want to be, you want to entertain yourself by having content on two screens, or you want to be productive by multitasking on two screens. Does it come with both screens, or you just buy the phone itself and then you got to purchase the second screen after? You have the option to do either way. So you can buy them together, or you can buy the phone separately and then decide to get the attachment later. But they do sell them together if you want to. What's and, the total cost of that, <laughs> that bundle? Uh, you know what? Last I saw, it was about $1,000, I think. Uh, if I remember correctly, let me double check that because I think it was about a grand last time I saw, uh, which is actually what the previous... Now, this is not the first time LG's done this, by the way, because we know that the LG G8X that came out last year was the same concept. It was the, this dual screen concept, put the phone into this holster, you know, activates a second screen. So this is the second iteration of that, but this one is considerably better in my opinion than the first version. It just, the screen is better. The, in, you know, the internals are better. Uh, the battery life, actually, you'd be surprised. The battery life is actually quite good on this device. You would think that with a second screen, it would be problematic. It is not. This thing will last a full day, even if you are using both screens for the full day. So it's quite good in that regard. The, the the dual screen concept is kind of interesting in this respect, but one question I have, Ted, is that second screen, is it really just another smartphone uh, or is it basically just a, a, like an LCD monitor, if you will, that doesn't have any brains inside it? So you couldn't just break out that second screen and give it to one kid and give the main phone to another kid so you have, <laughs> you know you're basically splitting a tablet in half, for example. Yeah, great question. Great question. You're right. Uh, it is not in, its, in and of itself a separate device. This is essentially like it's a complement to the existing device. It is useless on its own. So if you, once you take that phone out, that screen is doing nothing. It turns off. It has no power. It's got no, it has no, not even a power source uh, because the, the, the phone's battery is ultimately what's powering it. So in that sense, it's, yeah, it's like you described. It's almost like having a monitor that's attached to, let's say, a laptop or another computer. You're, you're, it, you're extending the, the capability of the, of the main screen. And when is this available? It's out now. I mean, yeah. you can get it now if you want to. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, it, it, it came out around the time, obviously, of the pandemic. So there was, there were some issues, obviously, <laughs> Uh, with that, but now the phone's available now. Yeah, you, if people are interested, they can get, they can find it and, uh, and they can get it. But the overall specs for it is it uh, like a flagship phone or is it kind of more of a mid level as far as? No, it's a flagship. It Definitely is. a flagship. Yeah. Okay. yeah, given the internals that are inside, the you have Snapdragon eight sixty five processor. You've got a decent amount of RAM. Uh, it's eight gigs of RAM, so that's good. One hundred twenty eight gigs of storage. I would have liked a little more than that, but it's fine. You can always expand that with a micro SD. Uh, card slot, um, up to two terabytes, actually. Um, there is a headphone jack, which could be surprising to some people, right? Uh, you don't see too many of those on phones these days, but it's there. And you can still use it even when you have the extra screen on top. So that's, that's possibly something that people might be interested in. 
Uh, but no, no doubt. The, the internals are flagship level. My one, one complaint I have, though, is that I wish they would have gone with a faster refresh rate as an option. It's 60 hertz. We're seeing phones come up with 90 or 120 now. And yes, it does make a difference. When you're using a phone, you're just navigating the interface. It does make a difference. Unfortunately, LG did not do that uh, with this device. So you know, you're missing out on that, at least for people who care about that feature. Uh, but it, it's something that I wish they would have put in the phone. And I'm not crazy about LG's software. Uh, the Android overlay they use is it's better than it used to be, but it's not great. Uh, but it's, it is what it is. It, it's still, I think, a pretty compelling option, though, when you think about the price point and the, the dual screen functionality. I mean, at, a, at around $1,000 for, for both of those things as a flagship device that, you know, has the specs to compete against uh, its competitors, that's a pretty compelling price point for the novelty of a second screen uh, in addition to being a flagship device. And I think that's one of the selling points, right? Because in effect, you'd be buying two screens. You're you're buying a phone that has this extra attachment on it that is supposed to be really, really useful. It's not something that you're going to throw away and forget about. The point is you're supposed to be using it all the time. I mean, one thing I love about the second screen too is because it goes, it articulates 360 degrees, you can actually prop up the phone too. So if you want to watch a video while you're eating something or something like that, you can just, you know, you can sort of set it up like a tent and, and you have a stand uh, for the phone also. So there are some, some useful elements to the screen that work that way too. We should also bear in mind, I mean, OnePlus came out, you know, with a new phone that is north of, I mean, it's $1,400 in the US, that's sort of here in Canada, actually, uh, in the OnePlus uh, 8 Pro. The regular OnePlus 8 is 1100 so here we have a phone with a second screen that is in the same price range. People might find that compelling uh, or they might not have a need for it. So that's why it, it, it's kind of niche in that regard in terms of the second screen. The phone itself is good, but it's, it, it's, up, it's up against stiff competition on its own. I think that that's kind of the, a neat aspect of this, though, is that you have the dual screen for, say, you know, your work stuff or when you're trying to be really productive, but you can undock it when you're going out for dinner or something else. Absolutely. Oh, so yeah. you don't have to lug all of it. And that's kind of one of the challenges with some of these other devices, like from Samsung and, and uh, other companies, is that, you know, you're basically committing to this thing, whatever it is, and you can't reconfigure at any time. So it's nice to have the option to sort of drop some payload if you need to uh, and go light uh, if you're traveling or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And LG talks about that too. And it is true. I mean, you can do that. If you want to lighten the load, you can. I mean, it's, it's not a small phone necessarily on its own, uh, but still, it's definitely much, very, very different when you don't have the screen attached to it. Uh, but, but still, uh, it's, it, it is that I think it is that trade-off of like, you know, are you going to use the second screen enough to justify paying for it? And my guess is yes, because I think people would find a use for it. I just don't know that they would necessarily be okay with the, 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 the girth, the, just the, the extra weight uh, that comes with that. That's one thing that, you know, Samsung has tried to address by doing their devices. The only thing is that once, well, Samsung's devices are more expensive <laughs> Uh, to begin with, I mean, the Galaxy Fold is considerably pricier than this thing is, but they're also not the same. I mean, with the Galaxy Fold, you could have three apps open at the same time and use them. You know, here you can do two. You can't do more than that. And if you are going to actually have the same app sort of spread over both screens, not every app supports that feature either. So oftentimes you're going to be using the two screens separately, but, if, you know, there are a lot of use cases for doing so. Um, I, I think it's one of those form factors and, and designs that I, I've been out with it, uh, and especially with the G8X before, obviously, the pandemic hit. Uh, and there were people who gave me a lot of looks with that, with that phone. They were like, what is that? Like, is that? They thought it was a Samsung device, but I explained to them, no, it's an LG device, and it's actually just a second screen. The phone comes out, whatever. I mean, there, it, it was a novelty that seemed to capture some attention, and I do think LG is hoping that that is what they'll get from a device like this, that'll just kind of turn some heads, you know? We can't uh, let this go without asking you about the camera on it as well, though. Sure, yeah. So the camera's okay. Uh, it, it's not, 
it's not as good as I would like on its own, like on the face of it in terms of the automatic modes. However, the, the manual mode, which I've always said is the best thing LG has on its camera and is well worth learning, is excellent. And they've added focus peaking on there. So if you're using manual focus in manual mode, you will see that, you know, kind of a green, um, you'll see like something green on the screen indicating to you where the focus point is. So that'll help people, you know, if they're shooting macro, if they're shooting something a little bit closer up to make sure that they're, that they're focusing the right way. So it's, it's a good camera, but only if you're using it to its fullest in terms of all the features that it has. When you're shooting just an auto, it, it's okay. It's decent. Um, the low light shots are not as good at all uh, compared to competitors. Um, but the manual camera mode is, is definitely one of the best available. And I guess there's no camera on the back of the second screen. No, 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 no. It's the, the, the second screen, when you flip it closed, has a small slit uh, that will show you basic things like the time, the date, uh, certain notifications, uh, stuff like that. So you'll still have sort of a window into your phone, but it's, it's a small one. We've been talking with Ted Kritsonos uh, all about the new LG V60. If you want to see a review, check out our website at getconnectedmedia.com. We're going to have to take a break. You're listening to the App Show here on the Chorus Radio Network. Back after this. You are back with the App Show. Mike Agarbo here. We've got John and Graham with me. Let's talk about privacy when it comes to photos. I don't know if uh, a lot of people realize when you take a photo with uh, a lot of cameras and especially smartphones now, there's all kinds of information being inserted into that photo, metadata, everything from what kind of phone was used, uh, what uh, size it is, your name, and even the location of uh, where it was taken. And so some people are concerned about this, especially now uh, we've seen a lot of the, uh, the rioting happen, uh, you know, with uh, the whole Black Lives Matter uh, movement uh, going on right now and people uh, concerned when they're posting things online that they can be identified and so many other privacy issues around that. But we're going to talk about a few apps that uh, help uh, take care of that. John, you want to start it off? Sure. Uh, so one of the, the big things, like you mentioned, is having your uh, – your location information is baked into the photos, which is really handy if you want to tag your location on Facebook or Instagram, but it also gives you very specific information about where your house is on a map. Uh, and depending on where you're posting these photos, especially uh, on like a, like a forum or something away from, you know, the big social media stuff, because I don't know if a lot of the social media sites actually embed that information in the photo, but some do. Um, Image Scrubber, uh, and if you just Google Image Scrubber to find it, it's got kind of a long URL. It's a website that allows you to open up an image. It'll show you all of the metadata that's stored in that image file. Um, you can actually uh, scrub it, like erase all that stuff or change it. Uh, and you can even do things like blur out faces and stuff like that. So say you're posting a photo of your kids and you don't want to show your grandmother or something like that. You can blur out grandma. Um, this allows you to do all that. The interesting thing about this and kind of where it's really interesting is that the, the concern with a lot of these apps is that there's still some server somewhere getting this photo information and it's being uh, saved or stored somehow. Um, this particular website loads everything into your device and you can even go offline before you even open up an image because everything that needs to do is baked into that HTML file. And you can actually save this file locally and just run this tool without having to connect to the internet at all. Um, and it allows you to then uh, go in and do some very simple manipulations with the, um, the image itself, as well as uh, getting rid of the EXIF data, which is all the camera information that we've been talking about, the metadata. Um, and then you can use a paintbrush to actually blur parts of the photo if you need to, like a license plate or something else that some other identifying mark or person that you don't want to include in that photo. Or maybe, say, your, kids. Or maybe your kids. Right. Yeah. 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 What else do we got? Uh, what, what was that website called again, John? Uh, look for Image Scrubber. It's, it's some guy's name, Everett, Everest Pipkin dot github dot io slash image dash scrubber it's not a very friendly url we'll put it in <laughs> oh, the blog post that. for yeah we'll put it in the blog post but if you just google image scrubber you should find it pretty quickly cool graham what do you got so i've got an app here uh called investigator photo investigator and so this was something that i found on reddit um and obviously there's a 
you know, right now there's obviously a great deal of concern over images that you might share, but this is actually, again, to John's point, something that can be helpful if you are sharing an image to a larger community that's outside of your, uh, your social community and allows you to do the same thing, but directly from your phone. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is available for iOS. And uh, basically what it does is it, you grab the photo from your library, uh, you can strip the metadata out of it and it will make a copy of the photograph. So you can actually retain the metadata in the original photograph and uh, just use the version that's been stripped out. This is, uh, this is handy for a couple of things. Um, you know, frequently I am sharing pictures from around my, my home or my neighborhood. And if I am sharing those in public social media, so again, to, for example, my Instagram uh, or to my Twitter, if I, you know, if I do link that image instead of having that image uh, on my profile, uh, it does carry all of that information. So for me, that's, uh, that's not something that I want everyone out there to have. So being able to do this very quickly on your phone means you don't have to go back to a computer. You can actually do this in real time. Uh, and it can be kind of handy, again, to have both of these as an option. Uh, while you don't have sort of the image editing functions there, you can go into um, you know, any number of image editing programs if you wanted to add some blur, but just for a quick way of stripping that metadata out, uh, this is actually a really handy app. The cool thing is for the foreseeable future, the developer has actually uh, removed the in-app purchase. So basically taking away the ads that are usually supporting the app, uh, that's usually a $4 uh, update. And so uh, right now, if you, if you go to activate that, you just tap on it, it'll say it's a $0 purchase, hit yes, and uh, it will take you through and that uh, will unlock the full features of the app and remove, remove all of the ads. Again, that's called Photo Investigator, an app you can get for your smartphone. And John talked about Image Scrubber, an offline, uh, webs, offline use website uh, that you can use as well. We're going to have to take a break. You're listening to the App Show here on the Course Radio Network. Back after this. You're back with the app show. A little bit of time left here. I want to make sure everyone visits our website, getconnectedmedia.com. Ted uh, has got his uh, LG dual screen phone uh, review up there. So you'll want to check that out. And of course, we have uh, our weekly contest. And again, getconnectedmedia.com is the website. And if you subscribe to our e-newsletter, it's a tab right up top. You are entered to win our weekly contest. This time we are giving away a Belkin accessory prize pack and get more info on all the little goodies that are inside there. But uh, this is a, a great uh, little pack for uh, anyone with a smartphone. Again, getconnectedmedia.com is the place to go to uh, check this out. I want to thank everyone that helps put the show together. And it's, uh, you know, it's an effort. Uh, we've got, of course, John and uh, Graham that uh, come out every week. They're fantastic. But also want to thank our producer, Christina Stoyanova, and the rest of the gang uh, back at the ranch, uh, including Stephen, Nigel, and Paul. And we'll throw AJ in there as well, just to give him some kudos. We'll uh, see you again next time. And again, uh, see us up on our website seven days a week. 